So we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And last week we left off at the end of Revelation chapter 8. Um, we left off with the trumpets being blown and these very apocalyptic, the kind of imagery that we think of when we think of the book of Revelation. Um, as each trumpet was sounded, those first four, we had hail that was mixed with blood hurled down on the earth. And then with the second, when the second angel sounded his trumpet, a um, huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and the ships were destroyed. And then the third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky onto the rivers and the springs of water. And then a fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and the moon and a third of the stars turned dark. And so there was this really cataclysmic succession of trumpet blasts and judgments that were coming out. And as we're going to see um, today, as we read Revelation 9, it only gets worse from there um, through this chapter with what's going on as these trumpets sound. And I will be honest with y'all, whenever I'm prepping for Bible study on Revelation and doing things, these are the verses that I just want to skip. And I don't know if that happens to you whenever you're reading Revelation ever, but you get to these chapters or these verses and you say, this is where I'm really pining for Revelation 20 and 21, where I know what the good ending is. And I just like, I just want to skip to that. I know that that doesn't confuse me. It comforts me. And I want that feeling. Um, but Revelation 8 and 9, I would not say to me, are a comforting text and okay i'm seeing some uh, some agreement in the head movements around as i looked at my screen there so i'm glad to know i'm not alone in that um but i also think it is worthwhile to resist that temptation and to say honestly does every scripture need to be a comforting or encouraging scripture to be edifying for us no. to be good for us susan says no Sometimes we need to take, um, if some, you know, um, to kind of use the Ezekiel imagery that, you know, God's word is as sweet as honey and sweeter than honey. There's also other moments where we have to take our medicine a little bit with God's word as well, and maybe read the things that are challenging or provoking in us, knowing that God's word still matters and still molds us even if it isn't in the completely pleasant way, like the promises of God in Revelation 21 or in some of Paul's letters or in the Gospels. It, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have something to say to us. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 9. There is a lot of pretty wild imagery in it, especially at the beginning, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, kind of following up. Rhonda, you ended our time last week with a question about um, the beginning and these locusts that come out at the sound of that blast and what power they are given here. And so I want you to listen, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but to listen for the things that sound interesting, the things that sound unbelievable, the things that stick out in your mind and either spark a question or an image, because this letter, this revelation this apocalyptic writing was meant to evoke emotion that's why it was written that's why this vision was given to john and why he wrote it down for the churches so i want you to be attentive to what emotion it draws out of you and i'm just going to ask after we read it if you want to share any of that emotion that might be there for you um so listening to that i think can be helpful but revelation chapter 9 says this uh, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke 
locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and their sound, the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had the power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollyon, which means destroyer. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. And it said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. And that is Revelation chapter 9. So after having read that in all of the imagery that is there and in all of the um, confusion that can exist in those 21 verses, what, what emotion did it bring up in you and what in particular sparked that emotion, um, perhaps reading it this last week or hearing it read now? Was there anything that y'all, anybody cares to share? There's a lot going on there. Did you have something, Rhonda? Your head popped up like you might have. Well, I'm trying to think if I should say it or if I should just ignore it. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. My first reaction to this when I read it a few days ago was just like, oh, this is a scripture that a guy that I was working with one summer in California kept quoting parts of it to explain to me how the God that he has always known was not right, not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, he would, he would just, when he's just had it, he's going to go whack and knock everybody off. And, you know, and, and I thought, wow, is that really, you know, is that really what that's happening? And then I realized, no, I think it's just finally, he is a righteous God and faithful and he gave these people all plenty of time to come around to him and to repent and he gets even in the the last the 20 what is it 21st verse mm -hmm. says now nor did they repent of their 
murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So, I mean, he, he laid it out very simply there. Okay, these are the ones. Yeah. Um, now, the guy I was working with, when I, when, when I, if I had told him that, he wouldn't have believed me, but that's uh, okay. I think he had more than that to worry about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, just, he just couldn't believe that a God of love would allow wars and people to be just killed all of a sudden uh you know and this is definitely a text that i think brings that tension to the absolute front of our minds which is why i think it becomes an uncomfortable text for us to read even as christians we can say oh i i don't really like those chapters as much as other chapters because it does bring up in our minds a tension and a dissonance that is hard to set right again, where you say, how, how is the God of love, the God of the gospels, you know, for God so loved the world that he sent his son, how do we reckon that with this depiction of what's going to happen in our world? And I think there are answers to that tension, but the tension exists, especially when we read it and we read such fan excuse me, fantastic descriptions of not just the judgment that's coming, but the manner in which it comes feels so extravagant almost um, with these different methods of judgment happening that we're kind of left just sometimes cross-eyed as we read this. I remember reading this um, even before I was a Christian, just in a Bible study with other friends when I was in high school. And this was the stuff that you read and you just think, what in the world are we talking about? Locusts that wear crowns with human faces and women's hair and lion's teeth. Like, what in the world is going on here? And I think that that is a valid emotion to have in this. Um, you know, it's been quite a few years since I read it that first time and was so confused. And I'll be honest that I can read it again and prep for study and say, yeah, this is still pretty confusing. Um, I'm not too embarrassed to admit that, that there's still a lot going on there. Um, how about anybody else? Were there emotions or things that this kind of drew out of you um, in hearing it or reading it? Well, I wondered what the five months, I mean, you hear things in the Bible, the 40 days and seven and all of that, but five months, that was interesting. And I don't know, to me, maybe things had to be so dramatic and bad because God was really trying to win them back. But so this is, even though with all of this, they still chose not to. And yeah. then the other thing I thought about was, you know, killing them. Okay. But torturing, that was an interesting thought about, you know, how they'd be tortured. It's and I've never been stung by a scorpion, although in Hawaii, I came close but my sister has, and I mean, it, it's really painful. So yeah. anyway, righteous God is a righteous God and he gives us chances. And if we don't take them, then, you know, to, to repent and see his majesty, then yeah, I, you know, that's what happens. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It is definitely one of those verses there in um, verses four and five, where it's talking about these, these locusts, which Rhonda brought up last week, kind of the interesting thing that in chapter eight, we saw already that um, the grass and the, the trees and plants were, were burned up and all these things happened. And now we get locusts that would normally be the destroyers of those very things. And they're specifically forbidden from letting their invasion, their plague be on uh, the normal objects of their wrath. And instead it's to people. And I think you get some, maybe un, it's hard to even say unfortunate translation when we have the stuff about torture, because that is such a loaded word in our culture. But what it's describing really is just this torment almost of 
physical pain that will not lead to death. They're not given the power to kill, but to um, cause pain or hurt or whatever might be going on here. Um, I, if you remember, we were talking um, in the other really evocative part of Revelation so far, when we were reading about the four horsemen and we talked about that first horseman that was on a white horse and came with a bow aimed at conquest and how we didn't really have a one for one image for that, but we referenced the fact that there are the, the Parthian empire and Parthian warriors in the Roman world. And that those images were readily assumed for the people hearing them as a fear of conquest from the East. That the Romans who heard that, especially the Romans in um, Asia Minor and in the Mediterranean where uh, John is writing to these churches, they would recognize some of the imagery that gets lost on us 2000 years later in a completely different context. And there was that Parthian imagery of these warriors, these mounted archers, and the devastation that they risked or offered for those that they fought against. And a lot of people believe that part of what's going on, a lot of the uh, scholars and people who commentate and do all their work on this think that there is a similar illusion going on here with a Parthian invasion when this fifth angel sounds his trumpet. Um, not only because you have this imagery of invasion, literally locusts coming in, which itself is a biblical reference to Joel chapter two, because the prophet Joel in his book, all of chapter two is this very long description of an invading army with these he talks about them being like horses, but he's talking about locusts and how they're just swarming. They block out the sky. Everything becomes dark. They swarm over everything. And that this vision of locusts is supposed to signal the, the bad omen of coming destruction from an outside force. And so a lot of people say that this is both a very intentional reference to Joel and his writing, that they would understand the people who are hearing this would get the image of locusts and immediately go to Joel in their mind and what that meant of judgment for the people, but that they would also hear within it some of this imagery about the colors that they wear and their crowns and the human faces, that this would represent the a coming invasion, which when we're talking about the emotion that this text invokes and brings up in us, it's important. I don't think John is trying to convey what things will literally look like as he's saying this is going to happen. What he's trying to do and what happens in apocalyptic literature is trying to convey the emotion of the thing without describing the thing itself. Here's what it will look like. And you use all of this other imagery and you draw on symbolism from everything that your audience will recognize in order to inspire fear, in order to inspire maybe terror or repentance or that, see, that feeling of foreboding in this place of this is terrible. I mean, this is describing a literal nightmare. And the point of it is to describe the nightmare of the reality of invasion and God's judgment and the pain that might be coming. I think it is, Catherine had something to say over here on the side. Yes, ma'am. To, if you don't want to be allude, uh, if you want to take it as literal. Mm -hmm. So let's go to left field. Um, I saw a star fall from the heavens uh, to the earth. Mm -hmm. That could be a spaceship. And this is when, when you get into the description of Revelation, this is what happens a lot is that we try and what has happened over 2000 years of trying to literalize the text of Revelation. Almost every age and culture has tried to literalize it with their yes. own imagery. Well, and yeah. also it, 
these are words more than 2000 years ago mm -hmm. or close to 2000 years ago yeah so they're describing you put somebody who lived 2000 years ago into today's time or even to a uh, 100 500 years in the future time what words are they going to use to describe us mm -hmm. and the culture and the stuff and but what going back to this chapter besides it's aliens coming to yeah. get us um the these are not the angels that we buy at walmart and target these are not the angels the the pristine little harpsichord angels mm -hmm. the 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 cherubic angel that you kind of picture in your mind either the cherubic yeah one or the graceful female with mm -hmm. the with the choir uh singing or has a musical instrument you can hardly find a michael or somebody with a an angel with a sword mm -hmm. but this is giving angels that we have fallen out of learning or teaching of angels were god's god's errand boys mm -hmm. and they were i mean here's this uh four that were yeah the four yeah. that guard the river euphrates for 200 million or no no that was the people yeah that was the um, troops that was the troops but so and the other thing is like okay so uh the troops that were 200 million i were what where is that i've lost that i believe that is verse 16 okay. yeah verse 16 so and it sounds like with that the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million i heard the number of them that's almost like yeah i know that's a ton of people and but yeah and a lot of commentators <laughs> think that 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 number being referenced so specifically is meant to just convey a Dude. number bigger than you could ever imagine like an unimaginable unestimable just it's that big you might as well say a billion yeah. like for us trying to comprehend what yeah. that would mean and what that would look like and when you talk chinese about uh, the chinese army what colors are they <laughs> well this is the thing is when you try you there's been so much in our culture that has tried to over the last hundreds of years say well what could john have been talking about in our culture talking about a star falling from the sky 50 years ago people said we're talking about nuclear missiles we're talking about intercontinental ballistic missiles coming and raining down fire and doing this like that's what it references that's what it must mean and before that it was talking about a comet that must come down and um before we had that or volcanoes or things that there must be ways to literally make this true. And I'm not saying that God cannot make this literally true. God can do whatever God's going to do. But I think what John is trying to communicate to the people is less a courtroom sketch of the scene as it will unfold. And he is trying to inspire the emotion of the scene into them to prompt them into the proper response yeah but he doesn't know his people then because people you give us definitions you give us uh they had tails like scorpions and there were stingers on in their tails mm -hmm. he said it so it must be true he ain't talking well, about it but, sounds like maybe. but this is this is understanding the genre of apocalyptic literature and when yeah. we when we started and talked about it that the a lot of the imagery and the language that gets used in apocalypse which is a whole genre of writing is similar to what we would think of today as political cartoon it you use pictures images animals things as a shorthand for bigger symbols yeah. that you want to include and again that doesn't mean that god can't say I said it was going to be locust, so it's actually going to be locust. Right. But the purpose of using locust for this audience is that it's an audience that knows yeah. Joel yeah. and they know what locusts mean right. when locusts come marching like horses immediately in their heads. Yeah, they're going to Joel too because they're steeped in scripture. Yeah, and you have that same thing happening as we go through with all of these 
with these pictures of the sun and the moon and the stars changing or going dark, that there's almost always either a biblical illusion or a cultural illusion in these references that is meant to tell the people everything that you have relied upon, both your faith, your culture, the powers that exist in your world are being undone from their very foundations. So um, why did the four angels have to be uh, bound to the great rivers Euphrates? Why? Why? I mean, let's. I want us to get to that on our next thing here because it is really interesting. Because yeah, because it's just like okay, they had a really long time. How long does it take to pre prepare to go? Well, let's go. Yeah, it says in verse fifteen, John writes that the four angels they had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and were released. Do y'all, I think, I can't remember where it was, a couple chapters ago, we saw that same passive voice being used. Um, and when the passive voice gets used in Revelation, almost always it's meaning that God is the one who is passively Jimmy. acting. I think it was a reference to um, the, the, the martyrs who had come before the altar and who were crying out. And they were told to wait and they were given and white robes were given to them. And we are meant to understand that that comes from God. And in the same way, we have the binding of these angels being so passive. They have been kept ready. And what do we make of that? That these angels were under the control or the binding or whatever of, I think we are meant to read this from that voice they are under the control of God, or at least were being leashed and bound, caged um, by God. For a mission by God. This, yeah. This is your, like, every, you've got your messenger angels, you got this, this, and so mm. God says, this is your mission. Stay here until I tell you. Yeah. We have seen, as we go through, it can be very easy as we're reading this to focus on the magnitude of devastation and we are certainly seeing the magnitude of devastation through the opening of the seals and if you remember as the seals opened that was the four horsemen um those first four seals and then there was a progressive judgment that came with the fifth and the six seals and then that brought us into these trumpets and now we see even more going on um and if you remember from when the horses were out it was conquest, war, famine, death. And then we saw a, a fourth of the world being destroyed. We saw a fourth of the people being killed, a fourth of the land. Now it's gone to a third who are being, yeah. um, first they're just being yeah. hurt, like you mentioned, Chris. Um, and then ultimately now a third being killed. But are they the same third? It's not, well, it's different percentages as it goes, because these are meant to be understood somewhat chronologically as it's happening but with progressing the same people. no not the same people right. but the same it's happening to the entire earth so the right. population right. itself but we see this like you mentioned the increase of the judgment also speaks to the the patience of a god that continues to try to offer moments for repentance that Something is brought for the, what seems like this arbitrary time, five months that you mentioned. And I think you're exactly right, Chris, from everything that I've read in my study on what does five months mean? Why five months? What is that reference? And the best that any scholars that I have found have been able to put to that is it's a specifically short amount of time meant to engage repentance. It's meant to be something that sparks and says, this is only for a time. This is bad, but what does it prompt us to do? But we see in verses 20 and 21 that even this invasion that is meant to torment and even a coming death that comes after that to a full third of the world doesn't stop people from following the gods that got them where they are, doesn't stop them from doing the things that got them where they are. Do you think that rings true of human nature? Oh yeah. <laughs> Chris agrees. I see Darla kind of nodding her head a little bit in the corner there. 
Yes. Catherine saying yes a little bit. Well, yeah, because it's like your sermon in life, uh, the men's ministry on Wednesday, we're saying everybody thinks they're good people. Mm -hmm. So if everybody thinks they're good people, then this isn't for me. I'm just mixed in because in the beginning of uh, chapter nine, it was saying only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. So there are still good men. The wheat and the shaft are still mixed together. So if you're not dead, I still can be good. Yeah. I can still have the seal. Uh, it's, there's, I just have to suffer through. And there's a definite allusion here. And I think a reference to the very idea of Exodus and the plagues yeah. and the work that happened that even when plagues are being unleashed against a people and specifically being withheld from another group that does not always in the human spirit prompt repentance of man i want what those people have but sometimes it can cause humans in our sinful ways we almost double down on who we are and say I'm going to be twice as much the me I am, and I'm going to overcome all of this other stuff that we want to almost spit in the face of God. We want to spite God with our own, um, I don't even know what you would call it, hubris, our willingness to just fight it out and last and persevere. And our ignorance as to what the true purpose is. Yeah. Right now. What's that, Darla? Stubborn. Yes. Stubbornness. Yes, stubbornness is a very good word for that. I was going to say, right now, uh, you have usually two different views of, of how America should be or how people should be in, in lieu of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. You have two, and they're both doubling down. They both think that they're right. Mm -hmm. they, and they can't understand the other side. So at the end, now this has been going on for a year and a friggin' half, uh, maybe closer to two years, but, and here we are in neither side, uh, do not repent the works of their hands. Mm -hmm. Do not, uh, that they should not worship demons. Each, each side thinks the other one's going to go straight to, you know, where, because they, they don't know what they're talking about. I think you definitely have within this a, a little bit of an insight into human nature and that stubbornness, which is the perfect word that I was struggling to find a minute ago, and that um, that unwillingness to, to waver yeah. that's almost built into us and in our desire to do that. Yeah. And I think for us as Christians, there's a message even in these chapters that goes beyond the the strict emotion or the call to repentance that exists here, because you have to remember that this was not written primarily or even secondarily to non-Christians. This is not a letter that was written to people in need of repenting as much as it was written to Christians who were in need of persevering. And so the message that is here also and I think this is an important message even for us because we don't know when the end times will come. The people who do say they know are trying to sell books. That's all there is to it because nobody knows. Jesus said he didn't know. So I'm not believing any author or person who says I figured it out on Excel. They don't know. Um, but as we live in the midst of a world that is unsure about where that comes, there is a constant refrain in John's revelation that says, do Christians of the world do not put your trust and your faith in the institutions of the world? Because these are the institutions that are going to let you down. If you were putting your hope, as John is saying, in the Roman Empire, the biggest empire that the world has ever seen of unimaginable strength and power and military might, it will be overrun by things you cannot even imagine. And I think that same thing is true for us today as Christians. Where are we putting our faith in the future? If we are putting it in the military might of this country or any other country, 
I think John would have something to say to us, which says, you have backed the wrong horse because the Roman Empire was unconquerable until it crumbled. Until it con was conquered. Until it was conquered, you know? And that's what we've seen every time something has become so big that it cannot possibly fail. That is true right up until the moment it fails. And I think that's part of what John is trying to communicate to the people is saying the Roman Empire is not just going to crumble. It's going to be overrun by locusts the size of horses with lion's teeth and human's faces. Things you can't imagine are going to overcome this place and this people. Don't put your eggs in that basket. And in the same way, the people who do put their eggs in that basket, who do maybe are jealous of those who are their persecutors. They lust for that power or that privilege or that ability to take the reins and say, if only I had the power, then I could do this and that and the other. He said, better than what is. I would do better than what they're doing. Yeah. If only I had it. And he's sitting here saying, it's not about who holds those reins. It's about recognizing that those reins are poison, that they are not going to last. They are not going to exist. And men can't hold the they, yeah whatever reigns there are men can't hold it for long because men fail um, yeah humans fail humans we have we are sent we we do we're not really good people we, without god we are pretty much left without uh left without a paddle here it is um, easier to do bad than to do good yeah and to do good and be good it can take so much effort in tongue biting and mm -hmm. and restraint and control. Yeah. And so I think if there is a message that we can pull from this chapter today, I think it is a, a reminder to not flirt with compromise when it comes to our Christian convictions or our foundation. Mm -hmm to not allow ourselves to fall into the temptation that says, well, if only I had a little bit of taste of this, or if only we just use some of that power, because it is almost always a poisoned gift when we try to take it like that. And we see ourselves corrupted or the foundations that we start to lean on a little too strongly start to crumble underneath us and then we lose our footing. Um, and I think that's part of the warning here from John to these seven churches. But I think part of the reason that this book and God has preserved it into our scripture today is because it's also a message for our churches today um, to remember where we place our faith and our trust. So I think we are almost out of time. We are not all the way there. Next week, we are going to look at Revelation chapter 10. Um, and and go through that a little bit as we prepare ourselves i'm fighting the urge because i keep wanting to like jump ahead to the next big moment in revelation or the next big thing but i feel like doing that might um undercut some of these other parts of revelation that help us to see the whole so if it's okay for y'all we might go through this kind of chapter by chapter and spend the time we need to 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 have those discussions and really unpack it because I don't want to just hit the, the greatest hits of revelation as we go through, because then the temptation becomes too strong to really skip the ones that make us uneasy. Um, <laughs> but if we go through it like this, I'm confident that we can at least read every verse and, and wonder and have to wrestle with it um, in front of God. I think that's how we can get our blessing here from it. So our, before we close out and we pray, are there any other prayer requests, thoughts, uh, responses, questions, things for this week based on our conversation that you say, I really want to get that out before we close out our time. We covered well, it. Well, it seems like to me it's like, you know, the fallen nature. And I, I think of that, you know, that study and help me remember what it's called about, you know, it's not about me. Mm-hmm. That, that's that because you know you'd think that the people would repent you know after seeing all this and all this explained to them but we're such you know 
we want to rely on ourselves. We want, you know, that when we have that selfish, terrible, selfish nature. Yeah. And, and so it helps me to kind of see that, yeah, there really are people like this that won't, won't change, you know, no matter, no matter what. <laughs> because they don't see it as themselves. They don't see it as themselves being in the wrong. Yeah. The, the, all the different wars that we've had that, uh, 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 the people who believed in eugenics, eugenics, mm -hmm. the, the kid, yeah, and who, uh, the final solution, uh, the people who, uh, China, when they turned to communism and, uh, for 40 million to 100 million people died, Russia, when they went to communism, 40 million, mm -hmm. uh, 20 to 40 million died, uh, they thought they were doing a great thing. They thought they were evolving, not killing the the local, the the common people. I think there is definitely as we as we follow through this, the opportunity to recognize not only the human nature that seeks to stop repenting and never admit that, but also God's continuing offer that repentance is there if we will break out of that. Because for all those that don't repent, I think there is always a remnant that do. And I think God is trying to glean the fields as much as divinely possible, saying not a single soul will be left behind that wants relationship with God, which is at least a if this seems such a drawn out way of bringing judgment to the world, maybe it's because God is just constantly holding his hand back saying, I don't want to do that. So is there anyone else who wants to change their mind? And we just keep having this. Um, but were there anybody else who wanted to, to say anything here before we, before we close out? Yeah, Rhonda. Um, John was just reminding me that this Sunday we go off daylight savings time. Ooh, oh man fall back i was gonna say that means we get that extra hour too yeah. this is the sweet one so um yeah. that may mean that we have some people accidentally showing up for bible study in which case <laughs> we are in the library and you are more than welcome to join us oh, hey. um and so we will make that happen i'll make sure to put that in a reminder going out this week as well i appreciate that uh that heads up just to make sure people set their clocks because i I know we might have some people show up right at the stroke of 10 wondering where everyone else is. Um, but we'll try to, we'll try to eliminate that as much as possible and make sure people are on the right time. But all righty. Well, let me say a prayer for us and close us out. And if there are any other prayer requests that come to your mind or your heart, I'm going to type these up and then get them sent out here as soon as I can. So just let me know and I'll make sure to include those, but let's pray. Father, we, ask for your blessing on us as your children, on us as a group studying your word, on us as a church and as a community, that we would continue to shine your light into the world. Um, we thank you for your word, even when it is challenging, even when it is uncomfortable, because we know that your word is always there to teach us, to correct us, to rebuke us, and to call us to follow you more closely. So, May you continue to pour out your wisdom on us. Correct us where we are wrong. Give us patience, humility, understanding, and a heart that desires to listen, to hear instead of to be heard. And help us to always, God, as we read your word, as we study it, as we share it with others, to do so with humility and with love. We love you and we praise you, Father, and we ask for your blessing until we can meet again. Amen. Amen. All right.